I truly respect and in many ways admire David Bentley Hart as a philosopher and a theologian, and I'm not someone who thinks that an optimistic view of salvation is necessarily heretical or even wrong, but I do think that the theological and metaphysical errors that Hart makes while defending the necessity of universal salvation shows why this type of universalism was condemned by the church in the past. The universalism that I don't really have a problem with on a dogmatic level is one which hopes and even privately and humbly believes that every human being will eventually open their hearts to God and be saved. But this isn't the type of universalism Hart defends because he sees universal salvation as an ontological necessity given the nature of God and the human person as a rational and free being. Father Aidan Kimmel, an outspoken universalist who runs the blog Eclectic Orthodoxy, refers to this type of universalism as confident universalism, which makes stronger claims than mere hopeful universalism. The passage I'm about to quote gets to the core of the metaphysical presuppositions of confident universalism, presuppositions that I believe are platonic as opposed to biblical. The following quote is by David Bentley Hart, and it's actually the header of the Eclectic Orthodoxy blog, so clearly it's a good example of the philosophical argument for confident universalism. Quote, to see the good is to desire it insatiably. Not to desire it is not to have known it, and so never having been free to choose it. It makes no more sense to say that God allows creatures to damn themselves out of love for them or his respect for their freedom than to say that a father might reasonably allow his deranged child to throw her face into a fire out of a tender regard for her moral autonomy. The problems with this argument begin right at the first sentence. Knowing the good in Orthodox Christian theology begins with a personal encounter between man and God. Knowledge of the good, and by the good we mean God, isn't merely intellectual, but personal precisely because the Christian God, unlike the Platonic One, is a personal being. To truly know the good means to fully experience him as a person, and the way this experience occurs is through mutual indwelling. In the same way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct yet fully interior to one another in their Trinitarian communion, we're meant to join this communion by grace while remaining creatures. The immediacy of a personal relationship can never be captured by the abstractions or contemplations of the intellect, and this immediacy is the fullness of knowledge realized as love or communion. This type of knowledge is referred to as apophatic knowledge in the Orthodox tradition. The experience of God is apophatic because the God who is now perceived cannot be defined. He is experienced as a reality which transcends all possibility of definition. So if knowledge of the good consists of a personal relationship with him, then the question is, how does one enter into such a relationship? What makes this whole discussion complex is the fact that Hart isn't wrong when he says that to know the good is to desire it. As St. Maximus says, as we progress in knowing and loving God, we realize that he's our good, and so we sacrifice our gnomic will by aligning it with the will of God. The gnomic will is the faculty of freely deliberating upon our actions, and we can choose to either do good or evil. The saints are preserved in their blessed state because they've fully sacrificed their gnomic wills by aligning them perfectly with God's. Through their renunciation of sin and their cultivation of the virtues, the saints are able to have a direct experience of God. The full experience of God, realized as interpersonal communion and the synergy of human and divine wills, is a state which one can never fall from, and Hart's argument about desire and the good fully applies at this final stage. But the problem with Hart's formulation is that he presupposes that knowledge of the good is necessary for us to have the freedom to choose it and be saved even though knowing the good is salvation. So he's completely begging the question. If we define knowledge of the good as communion with God, as the Orthodox tradition does, then there's no contradiction in saying that human beings are created with free will and that it's possible for individual people to never truly know the good due to intentional ignorance. While Hart is correct that to never know the good implies a lack of freedom, this freedom isn't the freedom of choice or deliberation, but the eternal and infinite freedom we receive upon choosing the good. We receive this divine freedom through subjugating our personal wills to the will of God. 
But whether or not we'll do this is entirely contingent, as it depends on our free choice. Freedom of choice is given to every person by God, as this freedom is necessary to establish a personal relationship in the first place. The creation of humanity necessitated God's self-limitation or kenosis. In order to create beings who could truly know and love him, God had to grant them the freedom to reject him, to curse him, to crucify him. In rejecting true freedom through the use of our free will, we enslave ourselves to the world and ultimately to ourselves. The passions enslave us to particulars at the expense of the universal, but the problem is that in the end, the dependency of the particulars on the universal will be fully revealed. In plain language, this means that in the end, when God is all in all in the eschaton, all pleasure, joy, satisfaction, rest, and whatever else we may try to find outside of God in this life, all of these will be revealed as only existing in God. Thus, those who reject him will be completely deprived of his gifts. To use one's free will to reject God in favor of finite and temporal pleasures is to become increasingly enslaved to them. Consider the following story I just made up. A husband and a father has become an alcoholic who mistreats his family and ignores his responsibilities. After over a year of enduring this situation and giving multiple warnings, his wife finally gives him the choice to give up alcohol or give up his family. She begins by reminding him of all the great times they've had before and how saddened everyone, including himself, will be if he's unable to stop drinking. She explains that he'll have to go to AA in order to get help with his addiction. But the man can't stop thinking about how pleasurable a drink would be at that moment. Drinking seems far more appealing than the suffering and embarrassment he'll have to go through if he stops and gets help. So at that moment, despite remembering all the good times he had with his wife and his children and knowing that he has to give them up in order to continue drinking, he chooses to remain a drunkard anyways. Due to his passion for alcohol, the man has freely chosen himself over his family. The past and the future became irrelevant in the face of immediate pleasure. We could even say that the man became possessed by the finite present moment. In this life, every moment gives way to the next, so it's of course possible for the man to repent and return to his family. But according to Orthodox tradition, upon death we come face to face with eternity and we learn everything about ourselves that there's to know up to that point. We're given one final and free choice, an eternal choice, a choice that involves the entirety of our personhood. This choice has the same structure as the one the wife in the story presents to the alcoholic man, communion with others or self-isolation. To choose self-isolation is to completely sever oneself from every other person, becoming completely incapable of self-transcendence because self-transcendence is movement outside of oneself towards the other. This state of complete self-isolation is hell. It's a restless repetition and monotony, a pure subjectivity that's broken away from everything outside itself. For a more detailed explanation of time and hell, see my video on Dumitru Staniloy's essay, Eternity and Time. Another thing we should note is that if the man had chosen his family over himself, he would have actually chosen himself in the end, that is, his ultimate good, because alcohol will never give him the happiness and satisfaction of loving and being loved by his family but he would have had to freely choose to go through the painful and often embarrassing process of repentance and healing. Repentance is painful because it involves a sacrifice of our immediate desires and ultimately a sacrifice of ourselves through humility. When we humbly confess our sins before God, we're separating our true self from our past sinful self. To refuse to repent of our sins is not simply to remain in our state of sin, but to harden our hearts even further, to stubbornly insist on ourselves. There's really something to the idea of the leap of faith, of choosing the good without any foundation in oneself, precisely because the foundation is outside of our sinful selves. To actively choose not to take this leap is to remain ignorant, but this time the ignorance is more willful. And we create the idea in our imagination that somehow our end, our telos, can be located in something that doesn't have true existence, because that something is reality outside of God. The notion that hell is a subjective fiction created and kept in existence by the stubborn will goes back to St. Maximus himself, who is by no means a universalist, as uh, many like to claim. Quote, 
All of these things will come about if the soul uses its own powers properly. If, however, it makes the wrong or mistaken use of these powers, delving into the world in a manner contrary to what is proper, it is obvious that it will succumb to dishonorable passions, and in the coming life they will rightly be cast away from the presence of the divine glory, receiving the dreadful condemnation of being estranged from relation with God for infinite ages, a sentence so distressing that the soul will not be able to contest it, for it will have as a perpetually relentless accuser its own disposition which creates for it a mode of existence that in fact did not exist. Now I want to conclude this video by briefly touching on Hart's misunderstanding of the knowledge of good and evil. He says that to know the good is to desire it, which we've determined is a fallacious argument because to know God, that is to be in communion with him, one must already desire him. God initially reveals himself and we're meant to respond to this revelation in faith, hope, and love. However, God revealing himself to creation doesn't necessarily correlate with creation's response to his love. In fact, the whole reason why Satan and the demons are eternally cursed while Adam and Eve are redeemed rests on the fact that Satan rebelled against God despite God's full disclosure of himself in heaven. The angels were created into eternity, which is why the heavens were created fully complete while the earth was formless and void. Adam, and especially Eve, rebelled against God in ignorance, and this ignorance is the space where God can still operate in order to draw them towards him. Consider what Christ says on the cross, Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. Since those who crucified him were unaware that he was the Son of God, Christ asks the Father to have mercy on us. It's almost as if he's making an excuse for us on our behalf, blaming our sins on our ignorance. But nowhere in scripture are we told that once God fully reveals himself, everyone will repent. On the contrary, we're told that once this full revelation occurs, those who continue to rebel will be consigned to their fate alongside the devil and his angels. And that's because when God reveals himself and we turn away from him, we become more deeply entrenched in sin. Consider what Peter says in his second epistle. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. So unlike what Hart seems to imply, gaining a greater awareness of God's revelation doesn't necessarily correlate with us opening our hearts to him. If this were necessarily the case, then we wouldn't be truly free. So a good analogy for God's condemnation of the wicked isn't a father letting his child thrust his or her face in the fire, as Hart says, but a father kicking his adult son out of the house for refusing to better himself despite multiple warnings. Sometimes people refuse to do what they know is right and sometimes they refuse to even believe they're in the wrong. This stubborn refusal to sacrifice one's self-love and self-will is the essence of damnation. Everyone is given choices in life, choices to choose light or darkness, communion or self-isolation, good or evil. All these choices culminate in the eternal choice we make before the judgment seat of Christ. Our eternal choice is truly free. It's the one choice that we're all given as images of God. And that choice is self-renunciation and communion, or self-isolation and hatred. I don't see how any person can claim to know for certain what choice every person is going to freely make in the face of eternity. And that's the fundamental issue I have with confident universalism. Thank you so much for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please uh, like it and maybe even subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you would like to support my work, I have a Patreon. I'm not really uh, providing too much right now. Uh, we're more focusing on just uh, getting more followers at the moment. Uh, but also, if you would like to support me, you could buy my book, Aphasis, The Impossibility of Subjectivity. I've heard it's a good book, so um, you may enjoy that. Uh, also, please join our Discord server. A lot of great people there, a lot of great conversations. And yeah, uh, thank you again for watching. I hope you all enjoyed, and may God bless you all.